I've always wondered whether God exists. I've considered arguments for and against the existence of a supreme creator. Rational arguments, emotional arguments. But I've got a problem. I distrust rational or analytic approaches to God, and I eschew emotional or experiential attachments to God. I desire God to be real, so I know that the easiest person to fool is myself. That's why I lean to the rational and watch what happens when arguing for God with analytic philosophy. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn. Not very confident, but closer to truth is my journey of exploration. How does analytic philosophy seek the existence of God? With sequences of statements linked by logic and driving to required conclusions. A leading book of analytic philosophy applied to God is The Existence of God by Richard Swinburne, Emeritus Professor of the Philosophy of the Christian Religion at Oxford. I was mesmerized by Richard's book, although it did not yet convince me that God exists. And I was, well, a bit intimidated by Richard himself. How does he present his case for God? Richard, I have wondered, as have most, about the existence of God my whole life. I come to you to understand the methodology, the way we can approach this problem, perhaps in a more organized or rigorous manner. People, of course, have often believed in God for millennia. And uh, I think their grounds for doing so, in part, has been that they have seen the physical world and they have wondered at it and they have seen it as a beautiful and organized place and they can't make sense of it unless they suppose that there is a God in charge who, is, who creates it and sustains it. And most of the arguments for the existence of God, which philosophers have uh, created, really just hone that intuition give it a formal structure. On the other hand, some philosophers have invented very much their own sort of arguments, philosophers' arguments. These typically don't start from anything you can observe, but from some abstract logical principle, which they think can only be true if there is a God. Um, now, that leads to a distinction between two types of argument for the existence of God, ones which start from are supposedly a priori truths, that is to say, things that we can know just by thinking, uh, as opposed to a posteriori arguments, which start from things we can observe. There are two sorts of arguments from these starting points. There are deductive arguments and there are inductive arguments. Now, all that a deductive argument does is to draw out what you're already committed to in the premises in such a way that if you were to assert the premises but deny the conclusion, you would contradict yourself. On the other hand, inductive arguments are arguments in which uh, the premises make the conclusion probable, but you wouldn't be uh, contradicting yourself if you affirmed the premises but deny the conclusion. Do any deductive arguments work to prove the existence of God so that no God would be a contradiction? Uh, not arguments that start from premises which are evidently true. You can always say, yes, this is a law-governed universe, but there is no God. That isn't a contradiction. It may be a foolish thing to say, it may be an irrational thing to say, but it doesn't contain an internal contradiction. Would a good inductive argument make the existence of God probable or just more probable than it would have been? Yes, I distinguish between two kinds of inductive arguments, what I call C-inductive arguments, in which the premises make the conclusion more probable than it would otherwise be, and P-inductive arguments, in which the premises make the conclusion more probable than not, in other words, probable. What are um, some examples? Yes, easy, ordinary life example. I'd say there's been a safe robbery. Uh, there are certain clues. First clue, someone called John there was reported being seen near the scene of the crime at the time it was committed. John's fingerprints were found on the safe. John had some money 
uh, exactly the same amount of money as was stolen from the safe in his house. Each of these clues is some evidence that John robbed the safe. Uh, but uh, by itself, one of these clues is not going to secure John's conviction in a court of law. Um, but as they add up, it becomes more and more probable that uh, John robbed the safe. Now, I think many of the traditional arguments for the existence of God from observable phenomena are such that uh, they give some probability to the existence of God. Uh, each one makes it more probable that there is a God than does the previous one by itself, but only taken together do they make it overall probable that there is a God. Cumulative. That is to say, the arguments are cumulative. Here's how Richard thinks about God. Deductive arguments start with premises that are undeniably true and could, in principle, prove the existence of God in that denying them would lead to a contradiction. But no deductive argument works because the premises of these arguments are not sound, not obvious, or not generally accepted. Inductive arguments start with observations of the world and could, in principle, demonstrate that the existence of God is more probable than not. Many arguments, according to Richard, add to the cumulative case that the existence of God is more probable than not. It's so rational and I so relate. But I pause. Troubled, should the existence of a creator God be demonstrated rationally? Should analysis reveal God? Why then do so many rational thinkers, scientists and philosophers, reject God? What's wrong with rational arguments for God? I see a philosopher who believes in God, but who questions how we examine God. I go to Harvard Divinity School to meet Philip Clayton. Philip, how do you see the potency of analytical philosophy in bringing us closer to understanding whether or not God exists. People pour themselves into intricate analytic details over careers spanning decades, missing a fundamental irony that drives the whole effort. A God you have to prove can't be proven, and a God you already believe in doesn't need to be proven. That sounds interesting. There's an internal consistency on the second part. On the first part, though, that's where the, the contention comes in, because some would say that through analytical methods you can make progress, if not to prove it. So can we increase our confidence that God exists? Nope. <laughs> it seems to me that the sense of proof being put forward in analytic philosophy is a very rigorous sense of proof. One takes generally accepted premises and one uses them to lead to a conclusion. The argument is that we can, for example, believe that something contingent exists and we can come to the conclusion that there must be a necessary ground of all things, which, as Thomas Aquinas says, all men call God. <laughs> right. But when you begin to look at the proofs themselves, what you actually find is that at some point a premise is brought in that the believer will accept and the non-believer will reject. In the case of the proof I just alluded to, the cosmological proof, it's a premise called the principle of sufficient reason. For everything that exists, there must be a reason why it exists rather than non-existing. Bertrand Russell said, why would I want to accept that principle? I want to see what I can know through science. I don't need a metaphysical starting point like that. The theist says, I find this completely plausible. Since God must be the ground of all things, there is a reason for everything well, that, that exists. Well, that builds your conclusion into your premise. Precisely. Yeah, and so proof in the technical sense fails. You can't compel belief in God, not through rationality, not by any other means. And I think most people would say that, even the people who use this, but, but what they say is that you can shift the probability, that the probability of God being likely, the God hypothesis becomes more likely rather than less likely under this scenario. Yeah, but what is this probability measure that we are allegedly discovering here? 
I'm not sure that we're increasing probabilities. Why couldn't we just say that there is a believing perspective on the world? And I'm going to show you what the world looks like. Classic teleological proof, proof from design. The world looks designed because I believe in a creator. That's not a proof, it's a faith statement. Cosmological proof, the proof from necessity and contingency. I don't prove there's necessary ground. I help you as a non-believer understand what I as a believer already hold. None of those are proofs. If we could just drop that word and say that theists describe the world as it looks to them, atheists describe the world as it looks to them, and then we have discussion. That would, wouldn't that be a much truer way to describe what's really happening? You can take a, a, a sequence of ideas looking at the, the world as it is, and through analytical philosophy, develop it to where it is more likely these things to be true under a God hypothesis. That's the flow. I don't accept the premises at all. Do you have increased probability? What is this metric of probability? What value do I assign to one or another theistic proof? Can you put a numerical value on that? And by the way, what values do you put on evil or suffering? How many anti-God points does that uh, oh, constitute? I, I think you've got to put some negatives in there. I mean, if you have your calculus, I mean, that's clearly a negative. But I think a calculus of God points <laughs> and anti-God points is as improbable as a moral calculus to determine ultimate principles of ethics. I think we can be reasonable about it, but the reasonability is a very different sort of thing. An atheist attempts to show as compellingly as she can why this is the most um, attractive view of the world available to men and women today. The theist tries to say with as much convincingness as possible why the hypothesis of God is a powerful way to tie together human experience. In both cases, can't we be more honest about the worldviews that are described, theistic or non-theistic, without proof? Phil rejects the position that analytic philosophy can demonstrate that God exists or does not exist. Sadly, I agree, but still I struggle. Is it a matter of worldviews? Theist or atheist, each with its own high-pitched claims, but neither with a superior legitimacy? I have, I admit, atheistic bias. It's a hope, not a belief. So I must dwell more among critics. If Phil, as a theistic philosopher, rejects analytical arguments for God, how would an atheistic philosopher react? I go to Oxford, England, to meet Bede Rundle. Traditionally, questions about God, of course, were metaphysical questions. Now, things changed a bit when metaphysics itself came under fire, largely because of the theistic element, but not exclusively. And the main opponents of metaphysics were the logical positivists. So they didn't want to say that propositions about God were false. They want to say they just don't make any sense at all. Not even enough sense to be false. <laughs> so <clears throat> their reasoning was this. Meaningful propositions fall into two categories. There are truths of logic and mathematics that we can arrive at by just pure reason. And then there are everyday truths that we arrive at by using our senses. And at a more sophisticated level, we have truths of the natural sciences. Both these latter categories are empirical, and they used to put this in the form of a verification principle. A principle has to be subject to some form of verification if it's to count as meaningful. That's not the only grounds on which you could hold that something is meaningless, because <clears throat> there are many forms of incoherence, inconsistency, and just generally unexplained notions that uh, you can have, particularly in theistic doctrines. So let, let's discuss that. The arguments today are largely from natural theology, looking at the world, looking at design and consciousness, miracles, a whole series of things that Philosophers, scientists will say is an inference to the best explanation for all of these different things, and then they come up with that the theistic hypothesis 
is the most probable to explain these series of, of, of things. That's right. And so that invites consideration of what counts as an explanation. So take the example of miracles. Yes. Suppose you go to Lourdes and you have only one leg and you put the stump, the other one, into the water and to your amazement, a limb regenerates before your eyes. What are we to make of that? Well, you can imagine even the most hard-hearted person say, you must allow at least the possibility of a divine act here because nothing like this is known to science. If we have enough of these that are well authenticated, we're well on the way to acknowledging the existence of a supernatural power power who intervenes in this world. But then you've got to ask yourself, in what way would that explain anything? Because how do you explain the division of cells to form an, an organ, say, or a limb? Isn't it more plausible to suppose that some of these processes have been taking place in a rather unusual way, but they're within the ambit of the natural sciences nonetheless, than to suppose that there's a being who created the whole universe, etc., etc., and he has chosen to give you your leg back. And so the main argument against theism here would be that it doesn't serve as an explanation in any sense. So even if you're left totally in the dark as to what's going on, uh, your only hope is that you will in time find a physical explanation. Why is that? I mean, that, that's a statement that you're making, that the theism has no chance of explaining things. Because God or any other supernatural agent doesn't have what it takes to act upon physical things. Uh, that, that seems to me to be the underlying problem in all this. And we just suppose it's making sense. It looks similar language when we take it to this different domain. If someone asks you whether you believed in God, you might reasonably say, I, I don't know, because I don't know what the term really means. I don't know what God is, so it's not so much I doubt his existence, I await illumination as to what it is that I'm being invited to give a verdict on. B dismisses God with two kinds of arguments. First, Things always have numerous possible explanations other than God, even if those explanations are not yet known. And second, the concept God is so vague that to ask whether or not God exists does not mean very much. Analytical arguments for God cannot prevail. I'm disappointed quite literally dispirited. Perhaps analytic philosophy can shine in a different light, giving depth and texture to reflections of God. It's part method, how to think about God's existence, and part content, how to think about God's essence. To appreciate both, I return to Richard Swinburne. After once more with Richard, how will I feel about God? Richard, what's the core methodology that your arguments for God are based on? A God is supposed to be the explanation of everything which we uh, see around us. And therefore, there's an analogy to a scientific theory which explains a certain area of uh, things that we can observe. Why do you believe one scientific theory uh, to explains these data and another one doesn't? Well, uh, because if the theory is true, you would expect to find the data. The theory makes the data probable. If the theory is false, you would not expect to find the data. But it's always possible to construct an infinite number of theories which satisfy those two criteria. And therefore, uh, you need a third criterion, and the third criterion is that the theory must be simple simple relative to other theories which will satisfy the first two criteria. Okay, those are your criteria. Now, I look at what the general features of the world are, the most general features which are so general that we sometimes don't notice them. First, there is a very large physical universe consisting of objects, planets, stars, cups of tea, which are of different sizes from each other. Secondly, that all these things 
conform to the same simple laws of nature. Now, what that means, if we just take one law of nature, the law of gravity, is that every object in the universe, every fundamental particle and everything that's made of these fundamental particles attracts every other fundamental particle in exactly the same way. Thirdly, these laws of nature are such that, together with the boundary conditions of the universe, lead to the evolution of human beings. Fourthly, uh, all that can be explained by these physical laws is the fact that there are human bodies. Now, what's going to explain all of those? Innumerable explanations could be put forward, but we're looking for a simple one, and clearly a simple one is in terms of persons. So if we postulate that there is a person powerful enough to do this, here is a start. It is simpler to postulate that the person has infinite degrees of the qualities necessary for being a person than that he only has large finite degrees. And that's because, oddly enough, infinity is simpler than 3 trillion, 501 million, 6002, etc. Why is it simpler? Well, because the infinity is simply the opposite of zero. Uh, it's zero limits on. So a being with the infinite degrees of the qualities necessary for a person would be a very simple being. And God is just that. He is a being of infinite power, infinite knowledge and perfect freedom and so one would expect him to produce a universe which is orderly enough for us to live in and which does produce us and what's valuable about us is that we're conscious beings and one would expect him to be conscious. You can't get simpler than the sort of God which I have postulated because that's the simplest kind of person there could be. You have used a formula to represent this line of thinking which you have called a cumulative case yes. inductive argument. What I have described to you is cumulative in the sense that I've described four pieces of evidence and one of them would be expected as if there's a God but not otherwise. Uh, uh, the second would be expected if there's a God and not otherwise. The conjunction is to be expected as there's God but much less to be expected otherwise. And therefore, as it were, each bit is such as you would expect if the hypothesis is true, you wouldn't expect if the hypothesis is false and therefore they add up because they are just what you would expect if it's true and each one might occur by chance perhaps if there wasn't a God but wouldn't occur but for, for all of them to occur together is if there isn't a God is immensely unlikely. You could have a hundred pieces of evidence each one of which increases the likelihood of a conclusion, a hypothesis, God existing, but altogether may still be less than it is more probable than not. Yes, that can certainly happen, and it can happen with uh, arguments uh, <laughs> of detectives or scientists. So uh, one has to uh, look at the particular case, and uh, the particular case will uh, depend on just how improbable it is that you would find this evidence if the hypothesis is false. And in this case, it is immensely improbable <laughs> because what are the chances that everything in the universe would behave in exactly the same way if there was no cause of it behaving in exactly the same way or if the cause was uh, some random physical particle which would have no particular propensity to produce a good state of affairs rather than a bad state of affairs. And you would conclude by pulling it all together that the cumulative probability is what? Is significantly greater than half, that's all I can say. You can't give anything more than exact values to that. I do not believe that any argument can make a conclusive case that God does exist or does not exist. Deductive arguments, everyone agrees, do not work and inductive arguments only seem to convince those who are already convinced. But I like analytical arguments for and against God. The reason is not because I harbor hope of actually discovering whether or not God really exists, but rather because the arguments immerse me in thinking about God. I like thinking about God an infinite being of unlimited power, 
knowledge, goodness, and freedom. I also like thinking about atheists and theists, how both use the universe to defend their opposing positions. How can the universe be evidence for God and for no God at the same time? Perhaps the universe is on a knife's edge between needing and not needing a creator. Something here is closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.